Hello, and welcome to Masters with Masters. I'm Ed Hoffman, the NASA Chief Knowledge Officer and Director of our Academy for Program Project and Engineering Leadership. These Master with Master events bring together expert practitioners and leaders to share their lessons, their experiences, and their reflections on NASA and the broader aerospace community. And this is a particularly extraordinary event from my standpoint in that we have two legendary leaders for NASA and the aerospace community with us, uh, Hans Barth and Jack Boyd. We're also privileged to be here at the NASA Ames Research Center in the auditorium. Let me start by introducing uh, Dr. Hans Mark. Uh, Hans has done uh, virtually everything in the larger area of aerospace and defense. He's been the deputy NASA administrator. He has been the uh, Ames Center Director. He served as the Chancellor of the University of Texas. Uh, he was also the former Secretary and Under Secretary of the Air Force. And he was also the Director of the National Reconnaissance Office and the Director of the Department of Defense Research and Engineering. So you've obviously been busy in your career. And let's welcome Dr. Hans Mark. Thank you. Thank you. And, Jack, and we also Jack, Jack just said that I can't keep a job. <laughs> you see what I've had to live with here. <laughs> and on the other hand, somebody who can keep a job for, for over 60 years, uh, Jack Boyd is the senior advisor to the NASA Ames Center director. He's also a historian. Uh, he has been the uh, associate administrator for NASA for management and has also served as the acting deputy center director for the Ames Research Center uh, and started at NASA before it was NASA. Please welcome Jack Boyd. <laughs> and so uh, I'd like to start, and we'll get to questions from our audience here at Ames. I'd like to start with uh, how did you start working together and what was it that brought you together and maybe share some... Uh, some background on each other. Me first. You first. Okay. <laughs> I got a call from the administrator, or the about to be administrator, Jim Biggs, saying he had this young fellow he wanted me to show around Ames and don't ask any questions. <laughs> so I said, okay, and Hans came and I spent a day. Next thing, though, he went to have dinner with Harvey Allen, who was the current center director. Harvey came in the next morning and said, I don't know, but I think he's okay because he could hold his martinis. <laughs> and Hans made a wicked martini, let me tell you. <laughs> and then went two other points quickly. We spent a lot of time here together and in Washington. But when we went to Texas, I, I like these two stories about Hans. He, he doesn't like me to tell them. <laughs> Ann Richards and he were having an argument. She was the <laughs> governor about space. And uh, she said, you're not utilizing your classrooms, your space very well. And he said, well, 50% of the time we do. And let me make a note to you, Madam Governor. We've got another facility we only use 8 or 10% of the time. She said, what is that? And he said, the football stadium. Well, that was the end of their friendship for about two years. And, and with the football thing, we were walk I invited Earl Campbell. Anybody heard of Earl Campbell, a famous football player, to lunch one day down at the downtown. And uh, he came. We were walking across the street to go to lunch, and uh, people were stopping and saying hello and to Hans and what have you. We got up to the luncheon place, and Hans said, look, I've come up, I've made it. People recognize me now. I said, Hans, they didn't stop us to talk to you. They wanted to talk to Earl Campbell. <laughs> and that was true. That's it for me. Now you can see where football is. <laughs> okay. So, Hans, what... Uh either stories, or how has the relationship evolved or changed over time? Well, you know, uh, when I came to Ames in February of 1969, that's what, 43 years ago now, uh, I was clueless. And uh, the person in the director's office who taught me how to do things here is Jack Boyd, because he was Harvey's uh, uh, executive assistant. And then, of course, both of us worked for Edie Watson for some years which uh, really got us, got us started here. And uh, I have all kinds of stories, but I'll 
tell you at the right moment. Oh, very good. <laughs> at the right okay. moment. Very good. Well, let me start maybe about uh, questions about leadership. You're both obviously extraordinary leaders and been doing that for, for quite a long time. Uh, Hans, what, what do you think are the characteristics that going into being an exceptional leader? What's necessary? What's, what's critical? Uh, I think the critical thing is the creation of an atmosphere where people can uh, develop themselves. You know, you, you bring a bunch of good people together and create an atmosphere where they can do things and then things happen. And occasionally, uh, I like the term management by exception. That is, you manage when you think something's going wrong and you say, okay, here we have to do something. But by and large, you hire people who are smarter than you are and that uh, works by itself then. And uh, I've had that as a principle, uh, what, for 60 years now. Yeah, probably ties to the DOD, NASA, as well as universities. E exactly, exactly. Right. And Jack, you once said, uh, investing in others is the greatest contribution that one can make. Um, from the standpoint of when you're, you're working with uh, young professionals, what do you look for uh, in terms of a spark of maybe present and future excellence? What, what do you look for in terms well, of I leaders? I like to look for someone who loves what they're doing first. They've got to love what they're doing. Also, I've been asked them, and I've done this most of my life, you've got to rely on other people to help you get things done. And if you don't get along with other people, you're not going to get things done very well. I think the other opportunity to tell people about is if we have a saying in NASA, which I totally agree with when it was said, failure is not an option. I think failure is an option in the technology world because you've got to try new things and sometimes you're going to fail. But don't let that stop you from doing things. You don't give up. That's what I'd say. One of the key uh, aspects, obviously, of leadership is how effective uh, are you in terms of times of transition, uh, crises, and change. Uh, both of you at different points in the NASA history have dealt with, you know, with that. NASA is certainly going through uh, challenges now in terms of budget uh, cuts, in terms of the questions of new technologies, concerns around uh, the mission in all of our areas. And you dealt with that similarly, uh, particularly, uh, at, you know, as Deputy Administrator during that, that time frame. Um, how do you deal? What should NASA be doing today to be able to respond to a time where there's a lot of uncertainty? Yeah and uh, setting of a direction. What, what do we need to be doing? Well, you know, many people sitting in this room today remember the crisis we were in in uh, uh, 1969. After we had successfully uh, landed on the moon, people began to say, OK, you've done it. Now what's next? And for the next uh, two years, I would say, there was a genuine crisis in the sense that we were cutting back and we were doing uh, uh, things that uh, were really no longer part of what uh, successive uh, uh, administrators had in mind. Um, I think that, that uh, we got out of the crisis really by uh, changing uh, the emphasis of the center uh, from the Apollo program, which all, we all contributed to, uh, to what we were good at. And of course, the aeronautics came up first. And one of the things that uh, Roy Jackson, who was our boss at the time, did was he initiated, and we helped him, of course, he initiated a new experimental aircraft program. And in the eight years I was here, <clears throat> we actually developed uh, five or six experimental aircraft, and I, I can see Dick Spivey sitting in the, in the third row here. Uh, the tilt rotor aircraft came out of that, and uh, you know we have today in the Middle East about 70 aircraft deployed, and, and they're working fine, and they're very useful to the military. And I think that that's an example of making a change that then uh, uh, revived our ability to hire people and, and to do things. And I, I might add, just if I may, uh, you mentioned we're in a crisis today. And uh, 
how many of you have heard of the committee that the National Academy has set up to look at NASA? Okay, good. Uh, tomorrow I'm going to have the opportunity to meet with the chairman of that committee, Al Carnesale. And one of the things I'd like to do, if I may, in the question and answer period, give you a little chance to think about it, is I want you to tell me what you think I should advise him to do. So please think about these questions, <laughs> and then we can, yeah. uh, we can go on. Absolutely. And we will uh, we'll come up to the questions shortly. Uh, Jack, again, you go back to NACA. And I know one of the, uh, uh, the, 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 the issues, and that's the pin, one of the pins. Yeah. And uh, one of it is pushing the envelope, that what NASA has always been about is pushing the envelope, uh, aeronautics, uh, space, science exploration. Um, what are the things that, uh, that you are part of in terms of making that happen? And, and one of the questions, and this was an event that was really recommended by uh, our young practitioner, young professional community, when I was going around and saying, uh, who do you want us to get? And, uh, you know, they, they, they came up with you. And uh, so we're, uh, that, that's kind of the genesis. And one of the questions that also came up is, is NASA comfortable taking risk uh, today as, uh, you know, when you were providing, you know, leadership, uh, you know, uh, several, you know, a few decades ago. I so. think generally not, but, but I should say that with some hesitation because we just saw one over the past weekend, which one, was one heck of a risky thing to do, and we did it successfully. But I think in the NACA days, uh, we were getting a lot more, f remember we were a very small organization first. We weren't very high on anybody's radar screen. So we could do dumb things, what seemed to be dumb things, and get away with it. And, but some of those dumb things turned out to be remarkable activities. Uh, I've said this to many of you people here. R.T. Jones, who developed the swept back wing on every airplane that flies anywhere in the world, was not permitted to publish his paper when he first talked about it because it seemed like a dumb idea. Birds don't have swept wings. Why should we? Well, <laughs> he had an answer for that. Uh, Harvey Allen and his blunt body, which is just remarkable. It's on every spacecraft that goes into the planetary atmosphere. We did that here. Uh, in fact, I did something I thought was sort of scary at the time, but Smith de France, who was the director, was a stickler for safety. He would let you do almost anything if it was safe. And I, in the mid-60s, it was beginning to look like we were going to go into space. Uh, and uh, I suggested to my boss, why don't we put the atmospheres of Mars and Venus with carbon dioxide and nitrogen, why don't we put mixtures of those in the wind tunnels and run them? He said, you, you're dumb. You're not, a, you're not a mechanical engineer. That would kill the blades in the wind tunnel. And I said, then why don't I put them in the ranges? So we filled the ranges, the high-velocity ranges here with CO2 and N2, mixtures thereof, and got some of the first data for vehicles flying at them Martian atmospheres. We had a, a famous astronomer who came here by the name of Sendek Kopal, who uh, said, these are the atmospheres you got to deal with. You better do some way to find testing in them. But they let us do those sorts of things. I don't think we're quite in the mode today of taking those kind of risks, but I must say, MSL was one heck of a risky activity, which was wonderfully successful. Yeah. That's kind of it. Now, I, I would... Uh, you know, answer your question by saying the biggest risk that we took programmatically uh, when I was here was to take on the development of the first large, massively parallel computer, the ILLIAC-4, because nobody knew how to, how to uh, program the thing. But we had uh, people here who, and then, then we hired some of those. We had Harv Lomax here. We had Dean Chaplin here. We had R.T. here at the time, Jones, R.T. Jones. Uh, and then we brought in uh, Bill Ballhaus and Paul Cutler and Ron Bailey and uh, a bunch of people that then sat down and we made the thing work. And what did we do? Uh, we hardwired it, basically. We didn't have an operating system or a, or a program. But what we showed was that the parallel computer configuration could do a calculation in 15 minutes 
that took the CDC in the next building, and the Iliac was right in that building, and the CDC was in the semicircular one, uh, and it took the, the CDC 7600 several days to do the, the computation. So we had a shootout where we said, look, there's something here. There were huge arguments about that because a lot of people said, well, you'll never be able to program it or anything like that. Today, every large computer has parallel architecture. And I think that had an enormous impact, and we started it right here. I must say, it shouldn't surprise anybody to know that Pete Warden was a disciple of Hans. So taking risks okay. is sort of in their very nature. And I think we've seen Pete walk out and do things that are remarkable and out of the box. And he got his training under this guy. <laughs> well, I tell you, <laughs> Pete is smarter than I am by far. <laughs> so <laughs> you're lucky to have him. One of the things that you're both uh, uh, talking about is that, you know, there was a, a spirit of, t you, you could take chances, you can try different things out, you, you had colleagues. Is that because uh, in the earlier years there was a sense of we didn't know exactly what to do, so it was expected to try, or is it, you think, a difference in terms of the, you know, the culture uh, or, you know, maybe uh, more oversight? Uh, you know, what, what accounts for? I think there wasn't much visibility into what we okay. were doing. So you can and do more. The, the other thing I would point out is we were very closely interrelated with our brothers at the other centers, brothers and sisters. We really worked. Whether the management of the centers worked together or not, we worked together quite well. And they had the NACA conferences, which were, you know, indicators of the things we'd done for each year thereafter. I think the crisis was also part of the risk-taking. You know, we brought the ILIAC here in 1970, 1971, I guess it was. And uh, I think that, uh, for example, another thing that was caused by the crisis was that we went out to other agencies for funding. Uh, I mean, I was for some years the most unpopular person at NASA headquarters because we went out to the Army. I see the <laughs> you all sitting there. And to DARPA. DARPA funded the ILIAC. We didn't uh, pay for that. And then we had an FAA group here. And this was something that uh, allowed us, I think at the height of this, we probably had a couple hundred people here that were paid by other, uh, other agencies in the, in the federal government. And we did new things with, them, with, with that. And that was done, again, as part of the crisis issues that we had. We just didn't stay within the, the, the boundaries of NASA. Yeah, taking chances, being almost entrepreneurial. That's right. That's right. That's a lot of ways. Yeah. Uh, one of the uh, questions I, I need to ask, and then we'll go to, to our audience here, is uh, vision. Uh, NASA has always been uh, an enabling organization, uh, trying to push the envelope, cutting edge, whether it's aeronautics, uh, space science, uh, uh, human exploration. Um, what are your thoughts about the vision for NASA? Where should we be going? Uh, what are some of the things that you hope you know, for uh, the future of what we're doing? I'll quote his Russian friend who said, the Earth is the cradle of humankind, but you can't stay in the cradle forever. So we've got to go outside. The and I, I like to talk about three different people. Von Braun, let's do this for the fatherland. Explore for the fatherland. And I think um, Carl Sagan said, let's do it for science. It's just pure science. And a guy named O'Neill, who Hans knew quite well and used to come and visit us, said, no, it's, it's, hum it's human destiny to explore. You know, exploring the solar system is human destiny. That's the way we've got to do things. Now, how you go about doing it, what processes you use, what steps you take, I've got my own th thoughts about it. I'm not sure they're all that relevant now. But to go out and do those sorts of things requires that you be a pretty good salesman, too, in order to get the Congress and the people of the United States behind us. I'm not sure we've got them behind us right now, but there are all, a lot of other problems. But I have to say, I think we're going to get them behind us. I wouldn't give up on any of this. As I said, if you fail one time, don't stop. So we can't give up. So exploration is, is the uh, you know, key core I about what so. we're about and humans are about. Hans? 
Yeah, again, let me separate uh, uh, aeronautics from space exploration. And uh, if we come back to this subject later, I, I'll tell you why. Uh, the vision for aeronautics goes back to the NACA. Mm -hmm. And it was actually driven by the fact that in World War I, the United States did not have one single combat aircraft at the front. We were way behind. And if you read the original NACA charter, it was fix it. So for 100 years now, we have been the leading nation in aeronautics in the world. You go to any airport in the world, and most of the airplanes will have been built in the United States. Aeronautics today is not quite the largest, but almost the largest manufacturing industry that still has a large positive balance of trade, roughly $75 billion a year, give or take. So that vision is very simple. It's still alive. And one of the things I plan to, to tell this, the chairman of this committee tomorrow is that if you do something to NASA that's drastic, you're going to destroy that. And we have lost too much of that kind of activity. So the vision for aeronautics is clear. The United States will continue to be the leading nation in aeronautics in the world, period, the end. Now, what about space exploration? Uh, aeronautics is done because we have a social imperative to do it. We have victory in war, and we have the transportation uh, 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 system we have, and there are several million people who have jobs in the aeronautics industry. You know, that goes from people that work at airports to the, to the airlines to the factories and whatnot. And as you all know, all of our political people say jobs is the important thing. Well, boy, this is one area where NASA ought to stand up and say, we know how to make jobs. Okay, so that's, uh, I think, one, you know, answer to your question. I think uh, the space exploration uh, is not a social imperative. It's something that you can do at your discretion. The social imperative in space is the military use of space. GPS, you know. I've heard political folks <laughs> tell me that, well, we don't really need, need, need satellites. I mean, what do they do? I said, well, when you go home today, you drive your car. Have you got the GPS in front of you? Most people don't know that. They don't know where it comes from. So, but we can't, we can't really, we, we need to help the military. And in fact, in the NASA charter, it says that the National Aeronautics and Space Administration shall work with the military departments on matters of mutual interest. It's right there in the, f in the preamble of the, of the bill. So there is a social imperative there as well. I think in terms of uh, uh, space exploration, there are really two uh, things. And as I've said, both are discretionary. The space industry, the space alone, doesn't employ all that many people, okay? But there are two issues. One is that the scientific uh, work that we've done in space is, ha has become very, very important. Uh, how many uh, people know that Two Nobel Prizes have been awarded for work done with NASA spacecraft. Ricardo Giacconi got the Nobel Prize for the work he did with the uh, Chandrasekhar 
satellite on X-ray astronomy. And John Mather got it for the cosmic background explorer for showing that the cosmic background is not isotropic. Both Nobel Prizes. Now, I will add that there are no, no, no Nobel Prizes for planetary exploration. And this is one of the interesting things, that with uh, Earth-based, Earth-bound, or Earth-orbiting uh, vehicles, we have done science that has genuine new important information about how the universe works. We haven't done that yet in the planetary area. But we should do both. And in the planetary area, I think that the objective must be very simple. We're going to put people on Mars. OK? You don't spread it around too much. Just say that's the objective. And I think at some point or other, there will be a president who picks it up. There will be a political situation that comes where Kennedy, too, will say, OK, we're going to put people on Mars and bring Go to the audience and, and, and go through some questions. You've talked about some interesting, provocative uh, kind of thoughts. Tony? Hans, um, I want to uh, uh, ask you to uh, come to, to, to uh, comment on something about uh, leadership. Um, you came to this center from a different um, environment. Uh, uh, you came from, from uh, Lawrence Livermore, a, a, a national laboratory where the kind of work you did there involved a different approach than what was done here. And you came here and you saw the applicability uh, of that, and in particular, um, the thing that sticks out uh, um, in my mind is something about um, a truck and the IBM uh, 360. And I wonder if you could if you could say something about what you saw, what you were thinking, and why that was important, because it obviously changed the direction of this center? <laughs> uh, that happened about two months after I was here. And uh, Tony mentioned the fact that I came from, uh, from the nuclear weapons business. And of course, uh, in the nuclear weapons business, you have to have computers because tests are expensive and you don't want to uh, you know, detonate too many. <laughs> And so we were really at the forefront of computer development at Livermore when I was there. I mean, I saw all that happen. And when I got here, uh, President Nixon had just canceled the manned orbiting laboratory program uh, in early 1969. And the blue cube over there had a bigger computer than we had here. And I forget, I'm not sure, I don't quite remember what it was. But I went over to see the colonel there. And uh, I you know, had, had uh, a fair, I, I was, I, actually, I was at that time a member of the Air Force Scientific Advisory Board. So I had some connection with the Air Force. And I started talking to him and finally said, yeah, I hear you have this computer here. And uh, you know the, your program is going to be shut down, so it, it's going to go on the surplus list. And uh, he said yes. And so he said, then I said, would you please uh, not put it on the list until <laughs> we can get a pickup truck over here and bring it over to the to the center? And it turned out that he was mad at the Air Force <laughs> as it was. And so uh, the computer was not put on the list until after it was <laughs> after it was here and uh, eight months later we got a we got a nasty letter from the GSA about what uh, <laughs> what, what happened with this computer so I rolled on the floor and apologized and didn't know what I was doing <laughs> and all that <laughs> so that's the ask for forgiveness that is after. the ask for yeah. forgiveness afterwards right that's the <laughs> 
I've never used that, but I've heard others around here. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the motto at, at AIM, just proceed until apprehended, no matter what happens. <laughs> and that's what he did. Right. So gentlemen, this question is for both of you. Since you've said we need a, I, at least I hear you, that we need an Oppenheimer or a Sagan, a man or woman of Im immense proportion when it comes to personality and salesmanship, shall we say, uh, to create a better Ames or a better NASA in general. Since we're working on just a half a cent of the budget, how and who do you recommend we send out to Congress to get the other half a cent? <laughs> Jack Boyd. Well, <laughs> I'd send Hans first and let him be the precursor to it. But you know, I think one thing we could do better than we do, the young people around the world and in this country, in this, this summer we've had 900 students here at Ames, uh, many of whom are foreign nationals, which has been just an exhilarating summer. You can't find anything to eat, it's true, when you go to the cafeteria. But if we could somehow harness the power of these young folks who are really enthusiastic about what they see when they come to a place like Ames and have them get be our, our mentors out in the world, I think that would help us tremendously. An individual I, doesn't come to mind, except possibly you, Sheila. You know? yeah, may, I was just going to say, may I add just a little bit to your, your question because I think it's a good one. Uh, the... What the what the the, the, the necessary uh, foundation of this place has to be te technical competence, okay? And if you bring a few technically competent people in, others will come. And so, in addition to the salesmanship, there has to be technical competence. That's number one. And. You do that by bringing in a few people who, who have it. And really, the rest of the institution uh, depends on that, and people acquire it then. You know, you, people learn. Wouldn't you agree? So, you, you have to have the technical confidence, certainly at the centers, but all the way up the ladder, yeah. I think, in the agency. But at the centers, it's critical, and in the agency, we don't control it. <laughs> okay. In the centers, we do it. Look, the, uh, the, the position of a NASA center director is enormously powerful. And it's powerful not <laughs> because we're all that good at getting money from, from Washington. It is because we can choose people. We can choose people to do the jobs that we know they will do well. And I think that, uh, I mean, that, that's what I... I, I want to add to what you said because I think it's an, uh, you made an important <coughs> point. And, uh, I think we have one more in the back and then we'll come to, to the front. The, the initiatives we've had in the last few years towards commercial space I know have been threatening to some in the agency uh, and some people are excited about it. And, and it seems strange to me that we NASA who are about doing state-of-the-art things should be in a position where anybody feels threatened by something that a commercial company can easily do. And, and you've talked about what direction we might be heading. And I wondered if you could just, I, I'm assuming back in, in your day, uh, you know, we were doing things that no company could do. And it just feels to me like it's a mistake. If we are doing things that any company could do easily, we should be further out in front. And I'd like your take on it. Okay, look, uh, there are, there's a whole spectrum of companies in the private sector. There are those which take an enormous investment for an innovation, and there are those where it is relatively cheap. If you look at the private sector, what you find is that the companies that are genuinely private are those that don't require a large long-term investment that can make quick profits and so on, Apple, et cetera, okay? That's not true about the aviation industry, and it's not true about, a, well, the energy in industry, for example, among other things. Uh, the, uh, the day after tomorrow, I'm going to be at SpaceX, 
okay, and that is touted as a big commercial enterprise. What it really is, ladies and gentlemen, is a NASA contractor. It's a non-Boeing or a non-Lockheed, and that makes it new. And you had an investor who had enough money to get it started, but he sure as hell can't finish it. And I'm going there because they want to know what I think about they should do, and I'm going to tell them exactly that. Work with NASA, and for God's sakes, make sure that the administration appoints competent people to, to do it. Go to the front here, and then we have other questions. Yeah. So, Hans and Jack, um, a comment for NRC, a suggestion, and, and also a question. For the NRC, it seems to me that since NASA really is floundering with respect to a long-term vision, now more than ever, it's important that the research centers be retained. Because if we don't maintain, and this dovetails perhaps with the last question, if we don't maintain a leading edge and if we don't keep pushing the boundaries, then NASA will never be able to fulfill a vision, whatever that vision may be in the future, uh, when it finally decides on some vision. So I would, I would just suggest that you emphasize the importance of research centers to the future of the agency. Um, my question is, and this uh, kind of relates to a comment you made before, Hans, about the power of a center director uh, with respect to hiring, and that is to some extent still true. But since your day, even since my day, um, centers have lost a tremendous amount of autonomy. Um, in, in the current NASA, um, we are micromanaged to the nth degree. Uh, I see it every single day. Um, do you think that's a wise strategy for the agency to be taking? Uh, well, look, uh, we had the same problem. But what a center director can do, I mean, for, for instance, I mentioned the Iliad. Um, we had the Army here, and the Army hired Bill Bauhaus for us, working on the Iliac, okay? We had people at the center that we could move around, Harv Lomax, okay? In other words, uh, the power lies in listening to the folks and then making some judgments about whether Harv would be the person to you know, lead the group that made this thing work. And that didn't, that, that, there was no micromanagement there. There was no interference from headquarters. They didn't know what we were doing there, okay? So I think even in a constrained environment, the center director has the power to do that. That, that would be mine. Now, with respect to the research centers, look, the research centers have the great advantage that they have the facilities. And we have facilities here that are useful in that way, and I absolutely guarantee you when they get through with their uh, stuff, the, the research centers will be, you know, looked at and touched, but that's not where the big cuts are coming from. I agree with that. Yeah. One other point, Steve, I think everybody, or nobody that's here was there in the days of the 50s when NAC was still in existence. If we had not had the technology going on that we had at the four research centers, we would never, ever have gotten to the moon after Kennedy said to 61, let's go in. We would never have gotten there. So we've been, been doing 10 years of technology already when we were in, in, made NASA. So it's absolutely mandatory, it seems to me. Yeah. We have a question in the back, and then we have a couple in the front. Uh, this is a question for Jack, but I think it's pertinent to the uh, NAS question. Um, and in some ways it echoes uh, some of the things Steve was saying. Um, it is arguably, at least from the center perspective, uh, it, it can be arguably said that OCT, the Office of the Chief Technologist, when it was established, is, showed a tendency to create a relatively large headquarters organization and, um, and is falling into the risk of being rather bureaucratic and perhaps falling on, on that slippery slope of risk is not an option where, in fact, it should be probably the least risk-averse organization uh, in NASA. So my question to you, Jack, is can a plausible case be made 
that the model that uh, OCT should be following should, given NASA's history, given uh, its talented workforce, and given the facilities that we were just talking about, that the model should be NACA rather than DARPA or other, other models that they've been exploring. And, and would that be relevant to Dr. Mark's meeting tomorrow? Well, I think it should be. In fact, as you recall, we've had discussions and even wrote a short paper on using NAC as a model for technology development. So I think that's absolutely necessary to look at if we can persuade somebody to listen to us about it. All you have to do is show what happened in the early 50s and early 60s as to how the technology that Langley and Glenn Lewis and Ames developed was applied almost immediately. It would be a perfect model, but nobody's listening, it seems. Okay. <clears throat> Takes a little while to get up. Uh, Dr. Mark, uh, you mentioned the social imperative associated with aeronautics. Um, I think we all understand and we hear that in the next 20 years, we're going to see a tripling or quadrupling of the need to travel around this country and around the world. And we already know that delays and problems that we're having with weather and with the airports, uh, we're seeing a $20 billion a year loss to both the public and the airlines because of delays. Um, it seems to me that there is a solution for that that is just waiting in the wings. The military has already started it, but it needs to go further. Uh, NASA is spending some money in this area, and they are the lead in that area. Um, they're working with us in the Army extremely closely in that regard. But it seems like if there was one thing that would help aeronautically is to help people understand that you can get rid of the delays, or the majority of the delays, by looking at different types of aircraft that can operate in and out of today's existing airports and stay within the noise numbers. And so I would, uh, I would, I would want your opinion on that, sir. You and I worked together in 1994 we, on we, that, and so well, nothing's changed. It's just gotten worse. In 1971, I met with your boss, Rich, uh, Jim Atkins. Yes, Jim Atkins. He was the CEO of Bell Helicopter. And we were about to sign the contract for the XV-15. And he, before we did that, I remember him pulling out his desk drawer Okay, and you, you may have even made that chart for him. <laughs> but it was a chart of what we could do with tilt rotor aircraft in the U.S. transportation system if we had them. And it was right all there, what, 40 years ago, and Atkins was the one who did it. Now, we have and are following this, the, the right strategy to commercialize the tilt rotor. We just passed, I think it was 130,000 flying hours in the Middle East. 165, 165. okay. Uh, when it gets up to half a million or a million, that's when it begins to get interesting for commercial service. That's the, and, and that's happening right now as we speak. So it's going to happen, no question in my mind. Jim was right. <laughs> <laughs> well, you'll be alive. <laughs> I'm not sure I will. <laughs> well, Hans, I have a suggestion for you with respect to what to say to the NRC. Uh, you brought the ILIAC 4 here, as you mentioned, and two disciplines came. I didn't notice came, Jim Arnold. Yeah, two disciplines came from that. Computational fluid dynamics, yeah. which is now worldwide, and almost met the goal that you put for it. But another one was computational chemistry. And I, I, I recall... Uh, a couple of things that you probably know a hundred times more about than I do. One is synthetic biology. The other is quantum computing. And so I could see a good historical argument for let's marry those two and go after computing how large molecules uh, conjugate and come together and create some kind of a life form. And that would be extremely risky. And why would that be in NASA's charter to do? And the answer is astrobiology. Yeah, I think, uh, well, we are looking at quantum computing uh, in the same sense that we did the parallel processing uh, uh, 40 years ago. And uh, I think there is a, there are, there, 
I'm, I'm convinced there are contributions this center will make given the uh, relationships that Pete Warden is now developing with the community that's interested in fast computers. So I think uh, we will continue to be at the cutting edge of that, uh, and I'm, I'm trying to help. That's one of the reasons I come here fairly frequently now. And I think, obviously, the astrobiology is the other one. You're quite right. So, uh, but again, that's not a social imperative. That is, the computer is a social imperative. <coughs> astrobiology is something you can do today or tomorrow or the next day. We'll do it, but it doesn't have a timeline. Whereas if we're going to stay ahead in the computer d business, we damn well better Unless learn how to do that. Let's say find us first. <laughs> okay. <laughs> what Jack says is there are guys out there that are looking for us. <laughs> Wonder, we'll, we'll go to maybe some more questions. And also, this was, uh, you know, uh, one of the things the young professionals wanted to do. So, you know, any of you young practitioners, you know, can, can start asking some questions from, from these guys. Um, one of the things I wanted to uh, get your thoughts on is recommendations for people who are starting their career. And I know that both of you are very, value that, you know, tremendously. And I was mentioning a story, a personal story I had to Hans and to Jack get at lunch here, <coughs> where the first time uh, that I actually was in the room met both of, uh, you know, these leaders was in 1983. And I was a graduate co-op student, and my background was I was doing uh, research into leadership competencies, how project teams perform at Columbia University. So my background is social and organizational psychology. And uh, 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 Hans would have a, uh, uh, a social event, uh, a party for the different co-ops, the interns, the students, a large number of them uh, in the Washington area. And so I had my friend coming up from Columbia, Brian Marufi, and I said, uh, you know, look, let's go to the deputy administrator of NASA's party. And he said, no, 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 let's not do that. That'll be, it'll be boring and, you know, we don't need the, I, and to me it met the number one criteria for a graduate student, which is I knew it would provide free food. <laughs> and so I talked to my friend, we, we drove up to the house and uh, we got, there it was a beautiful home, uh, it was very festive, uh, large parts, most of the leadership uh, was there at the event, there were about, uh, you know, 30, 30 or so of us students, so there was a lot of activity. For the first half hour, I'm joining myself. There was good food, uh, a little bit of wine, and uh, free drinks. Free drinks, <laughs> free drinks. And all of a sudden, Dr. Dr. Mark gets everyone around him, and he's at the center of the room. Uh, there was a little light pointing at him. No, that's, and uh, his management was, uh, was around, the, the students were there. And I'm stuffing my face, and all of a sudden, I hear, uh, and say, I want to welcome all of you here, uh, you know, to this, uh, to this event, particularly the students, because you recommend, uh, you, you know, you're the future of us, and, uh, you know, really it's, it's critical that we bring on board the, the best. And he said, you know, I see that we have uh, 29 of you are aerospace engineers, and I know why you are here. And one of you is a psychology guy from Columbia, and I have no idea what you're doing here. <laughs> and at this point... For the first time in my life, my body just heats up in a way that someone with a biology background would probably explain to me. And I get this, this ball of sweat right on the back of my neck, and I know where this is going. And so uh, Hans says, uh, can you identify yourself? And I you know, say, I'm Ed Hoffman. I'm from Columbia University. And uh, he says, well, why are you here? And you realize how great a question that is. You would think that someone would know why they're at NASA, but that was really the first time it really locked in, why am I here? And I said, uh, I'm here, you know, helping teams, how they work together, uh, you know, how, how leaders perform. And he says, uh, well, I'm a leader. Now I know where this is going to go. And he says, can you help me become a more effective leader? Now that ball has just doubled in size, you know, in terms of the back. And uh, being trained classically, you know, in the arts, uh, I throw the question back and I said, well, uh, can you give me an example of an effective leadership practice that you use? 
And he says, well, one of the things I like to do is I write uh, down, I guess what we're called Hansgrams, is that I'd write little notes on yellow stickies at the end of the day, and I'd leave, leave them all over you know, with my management team. He says, does that make me a good leader? And now behind him, he can't see, but his management staff is giving all kinds of signals you know, to tell him why it's not. And uh, you know, again, I don't know what to say, but I, again, classically trained, so I said, well, why do you think that's a good practice? Why do you do it? And he says, well, I communicate with my folks. They know what's a priority, and I know when they first get in in the morning, and I expect them in early, they know kind of what I'm expecting. And I said, well, based on what you're saying, that sounds like a good practice. So I finally get in that. I, I'm totally covered in water. He goes on and talks to other folks. I turned to my friend and said, you are, why did we come here? <laughs> and uh, about 30 minutes later, though, you know, he invites me to his office, a couple of other students, and he's showing me around different you know, wards and Merrill's and said, by the way, I'm, I'm still not totally sure why you're here, but I like your answer. You, you, you handle that really well. And so uh, that was when I had an appreciation for being prepared and what a testing organization meant, which means you should know why you're at a place. And, uh, but, but it also is a story that I've, I've spoken to folks about is the commitment to, uh, to young people and to folks joining. The fact that there was a strong community then and we would go to these events and you'd meet the leadership and they would, you know, test you, ask questions, but mostly interaction. And um, uh, with that long background, I'd say both of you are heavily involved in, in doing these things. Um, what do you recommend for folks who started an organization or who started NASA or, you know, what are your recommendations for young professionals in terms of being successful or having a career? Uh, Boy. How do you go about that? <laughs> well, first find a mentor. Find a mentor. Find one or more mentors. Yeah. How do you find a mentor? And most people are really happy to do it. If you yeah. Just talk to somebody. Talk to people. Go around and talk to them. Most of them will be happy to deal with you. One, be persistent. If they're not, just be persistent. Otherwise, get to know your, your colleagues as best you can. Get to know them because you're going to work together with them, I think, for the rest of your life, for the rest of your career sometimes. I have people that used to come to my house as well as Hans's who I still see and some of whom work here. That was 30, 40 years ago. Now they're about to retire. It's true. And perhaps I am too, but for that matter. <laughs> Oh, no, honey, I'm not about to retire. Okay. <laughs> but that's my observation. Right. Get a mentor, yeah. Hans? Well, w one of the things uh, that I do right now, and some of you may, may be in that class, uh, I teach a freshman course in our department, in the aerospace department. And at the end of the first year and then at the end of the second year, I always pick a group of people to send to NASA centers. NASA has this uh, scholarship for uh, summer jobs. Is there anybody here who came from UT? Yeah? yeah several hands. Okay, two. <laughs> two. <laughs> so uh, I think that, that, and this is advice really for what I might call a pre-professional, but the people who have had the interns positions and the co-op positions uh, have no problem finding jobs even today in the current environment. So get with it early. I guess that's the, that's the short advice. Do it as soon as you can. I think we have time probably. I'm getting signals for we have a couple of minutes left. It's gone really quick. Kevin, I see you. You have a question? So both of you mentioned the importance of technical excellence and leadership. But where do you see maybe somebody with less technical experience but more management experience in the NASA leadership? Where do you see it needed, you say? Yeah. Well, so let's if see. You're, uh, if, well, if you're like me, basically, well, if you're coming at least from a... The management here at Ames, I think, recognized some time ago that technical excellence alone isn't going to hack it at a research technology center. I know in the mid-60s, I'd been here, what, almost 20 years? They said, okay, you, you've done your thing in technical things. Now we're going to send you off to the Stanford Sloan program because we need people who understand finance, procurement, what have you. I said, I don't want to go to the Stanford Sloan program. <laughs> I, that's got to be dull. That's really, but I went, and it was probably one of the best experiences I had. Uh, 
and it helped me understand how other people, where other people were coming from too. But I think that mix of a technical, an engineering background, and a business background has been quite useful to me. So you need a mix, clearly. I agree. Who, who are your mentors? I had three that I remember. Harvey Allen, who was just a delightful man other than, and, and brilliant. And he did the same thing that Hans and I have tended to do. At his house, he would have, he was a great pianist in addition to being, and he would play the piano and a wonderful martini maker. I remember going over once to his house for lunch, and I called my wife about 7 o'clock that night and said, please come and get me because <laughs> I can't drive home. But he was a brilliant guy, and he, and R.T. Jones, was the one who told me when I got here, read everything you can find out. We'll give you six months before we give you a real job to do. Uh, and th those two were, and Walt Vincenti, who was another giant in the, in the one by three foot supersonic wind tunnel, and one of our computers this year, who used to work there for us. Anyways, was uh, instrumental in teaching me how to write. Engineers are notoriously poor writers. And not too good speakers, for that matter. But the combination of those two, he helped me with. I agree. Oh, my mentors. Oh, oh boy. <laughs> uh, well, I think uh, I had, uh, uh, my father was a scientist. And so he was obviously the, the number one mentor. Uh, he had a student by the name of Edward Teller <laughs> who became <laughs> my second mentor. And then I think in the, in the area of, of management, that is, you know, high level, uh, dealing with, with high level politics and so on, uh, I, would, I would have to say, that Johnny Foster was my my mentor there. John, I don't know how many. It, the, the, we had a, an associate director here named John Foster, but I'm talking about the one who was in the nuclear weapons business and then became went into the Pentagon. But John Foster was a a, a good physicist and he also understood management. So I would say those three. So the importance of uh, finding a mentor very clear. And also being able to answer the question while you're here. It's one of the things I would share. And uh, they tell me that the time has, uh, has gone by, which uh, for me has been uh, just incredibly fast. Uh, you know, NASA is a great place to work at. I've been here 29 years. This is one of those days I'll always cherish and remember. Uh, and be thankful, uh, Hans, and to Jack for taking the time to do this. And uh, I'd like uh, all of you to, to thank them uh, for taking the time. And, uh, and you're halfway there. I'm halfway there. You're halfway there. There you right? go. Another. <laughs> yeah. There you go. And even then, I wouldn't match your time. I also want to thank uh, the great folks at NASA Ames Research Center, uh, particularly the folks in the Public Affairs Group, uh, the TV crew, and the leadership for hosting us and uh, making this happen. So thank you very much.